thanks. First of all, thanks for coming to this session. It's like the second to last. Everyone is tired, like the second day. Uh, so thanks very much for coming to the session. Um, I'll be talking mostly about Rails 6. There are tons of changes that I need to go through. Uh, Rails has uh, been on this release for quite a long time. And uh, some of the parts I might skip because uh, there's lots of ground to cover. Uh, but I'll try to focus more on the bigger changes which are coming in, like the newer components which have been added, uh, as well as some bigger portions uh, of uh, Rails in, in different parts of Rails that have been changed. Um, my name is Vipul. I go by the handle of Vipul and Sword on Twitter. Uh, and I uh, run this company called as Saloon, which is a Ruby on Rails uh, consulting company. We tend to blog a lot about Ruby uh, as well as uh, latest things in Rails. Uh, while I'm not working, uh, like I work remotely, so what I do is most of the time I work from uh, various parts of the world, uh, especially from US because the, the, that's where my clients are or for uh, conferences or like over here. Uh, because my work allows it uh, since I work remotely. But a side effect of this is I happen to uh, be in places where things are always happening. So last time I was in Japan uh, last year, uh, there was this typhoon in Kyoto, so I was stuck there. Uh, luckily, I didn't go to Hokkaido, uh, which, which uh, in the same week, there was an earthquake over there, uh, and my flight was canceled. Uh, I happened to be here. I am <laughs> really not sure like how I survived that. Like I was on the ninth floor of the hotel, and I thought like, okay. <laughs> Uh, and then there are these small other things which <laughs> I was I was also here, uh, and this blackout happened like after 40 years, uh, which is kind of crazy because I don't know like how does a city go without blackouts? Like a blackout happens like every other week back uh, back at home in India, um, and so I feel feel like somehow like <laughs> I'm like I don't want to be this guy, but like. Everywhere I go, something is happening, so I just want to avoid, uh, you know, just be safe. Anyway, so I'm glad that I was able to make here, uh, based partly also because I have been working uh, from Boston, and if you see, uh, that's how the time is. Um, and so yeah, most of the I got here on Wednesday, and I've just been sleeping most of the time. Anyway, back to Rail Six. Uh, before we begin, how many of you are Rails developers over here? Work with Rails? Oh, that's quite few. Nice. Um, before I start, or like started looking at all the things or changes which have gone into Rails, you just look at so many. This is from Edge API. Like these are so many things which are actually existing in Rails, and it's like even harder to look at. Like there's so many different components, and the major ones amongst these are like these. 13 components in Rails. Yeah, like when we started, there were very, uh, very much less, but now there are like around 13 major components or parts of Rails. Uh, and right now, uh, two of them are the newest additions to Rails that we'll take a look at. So we'll look at the newer components as well as what are some major changes in the existing components in Rails. So yeah, uh, first newest, newest component is Action Mailbox. Uh, if any of you uses GitHub or Jira or Trello or these kind of technologies, one of the things which allows you to do is if you get an email or notification, if you reply to that notification, you can see that it actually creates this kind of uh, comment on those services. So this can be achieved by actually listening to those comments uh, in services um, for emails and then processing those. Rails already allowed to uh, like, handle incoming emails in your applications. So previously, if you had a mailer, uh, instead of sending mail, what you could do is you could uh, write this method called receive, and then run this as a Rails runner, this service. And when the email was provided to it from STDN, it would 
pass the email and they then make it available to however the application wants it to process. Uh, as you see over here, this is not pretty uh, easier to do because you have to run those services independently. So now this comes in a, and it was not like pretty useful or widely used. So now uh, this comes out of the box now with Action Mailbox in a better way. Uh, to get started to use this, basically you can just do Action Mailbox install. If you're using Rails 6 uh, version, you can run this and then what it does is it creates a migration to store your email messages as well as if you have attachment, it also stores attachment using active storage. And then you can specify what kind of mailing service you want to use for the emails to come in. For example, uh, Rails supports these right now, which is you can set up your own SMTP relay. You can use Mailgun, Mandrill, Postfix, uh, Qmail, uh, SendGrid, these services. And then from those services, whenever someone sends an email, that will hit your application. And to get started, the entry point would be this app, main application mailbox where you set the routing. So basically what we say over here is, if an email contains forward at, like you write patterns and then say to which mailbox this particular email should be processed. So if the email is from forward at whatever, it will be processed by the forwards mailbox. And so after this matching is done, the routing is done like the Rails route, it will go to this uh, forwards mailbox wherein you, you have to define just one single method which is process. And this process method is made available the email object which you can then process uh, as you want. For example, here uh, as you can see what it does is it first of all tries to find for which, which user, existing user in the system send this email from the mail from address. If it doesn't find it, it you can take different action, which is bouncing or you know notifying the user. Uh, bouncing is the way that if you if you have noticed, like you send try to send an, uh, an email to some service, if it doesn't process it, it will bounce back saying that hey, I cannot process this uh, email. For example, like a uh, email address is invalid. Google sometimes says, oh, this is invalid. I cannot process it. Um, you can do that in uh, using these two methods right now, which is bounced. Bounce will say that, oh, uh, don't do anything. Just this method, we cannot process this email anymore uh, that we received. Or we can use bounce with, wherein you can specify bounce and send some kind of mailer message to the email that we just received. Since the emails that we received, they will have like user data, so we don't actually want to keep them in our system. So incineration is available by default in mailbox as in every 30 days, the emails that have been received they, uh, and which is configurable, those emails will be deleted. If you want to, you can also use this incineration job, which after you have processed your emails, uh, you can immediately delete instead of storing in your systems. So this is pretty handy to build those kind of services that we saw like what GitHub uh, or Basecam and others uh, support. Mailbox also comes with a way to test things, uh, which like, for example, uh, when Action Cable was introduced, didn't have. So here, if you see, uh, we are provided with Action Mailbox test case. And the important thing to note over here is just the receive inbound email from mail. Uh, you can just trigger an email and then uh, this allows us to test uh, an actual email coming into the system and how it gets processed by whichever mailbox service. Another new thing which has been added uh, to, like it's kind of a bigger change for uh, the rail system is Zitework. So Zitework was added by uh, Xavier. Uh, and before we go ahead, how many of you have done this? <laughs> I said that I mentioned this to Rafael uh, that oh this is what I do a lot of time. He's like no, it's it basically means you have bug in your application code, which is like everyone has this uh, code uh, like bug. One of the issues with this is that there are a lot of like uh, this is from the Rails issues tracker. There are lots of things like issues with the auto loading uh, in Rails, most mostly also because of thread safety and the way the difference is how it works on production and development. So now 
a new mode of auto loading has been introduced which is Zitework. Uh, you can switch between those two like the older mode is called classic mode and the newer one is Zitework. Uh, basically in cla and this is if you have your whole, whole structure right now if you upgrade to Rails 6 everything should work uh, as it is there's no changes to the product project structure uh, just that the, this is a bigger change over here like in classic mode the inference of the files was done from the constant names for example if you use a constant and it has not been loaded yet what it does is it tries to find the name of the file from the load path and the, it then tries to you know identify the constant or load that file and it uses underscore to do that for example if you try to load foo it will underscore it and try to file it find it in foo file in zitework mode it's a bit opposite it tries to find the constants from the file name instead and so a difference over here is like you cannot load that foo cap like double big o's it should be like this kind of uh, convention if you have upgraded to rails 6 easiest way to check if everything is fine in your system is just a running zitework check and it will just load everything and see if everything is fine. I'll go through some big changes which happen because of Zitework because I feel like this is like a useful part that has come in Rails. So by default, uh, this auto loading now matches like Ruby, basic Ruby semantics uh, instead of the magical things that Rails used to do before. Uh, so one of the changes that you see over here, like the namespacing that you see in the controller that should work fine. One of the big change over here, if you see, is that previously, if you did this class foo bar, and then you you tried to use bars, if the file in the file is defined in foo like bar dot rb, the bars would sometimes pre auto load, sometimes it would not auto load in development. Um, now, and it was like an inconsistent behavior, but now in Zitework, it will always fail, and you will have to use like a namespaced way of accessing things over here. So it provides more consistent behavior. Uh, this also affects concerns if you have used concerns. How many of you used concerns here? All right. So if you've used concerns, you know that most of the people like they put them either in the concern, they put them in the concerns directory and then you would define them in namespaced way, that is concerns something, which is actually not the intention. It was just because the directory structure was that way, uh, the concerns ended up being concerns namespaced whereas they should just be top level namespaced so with zitework uh, that's the bigger change if you have a concern defined like app model concern foo.rb in that file it is considered as top level and it should be identified by foo instead of concerns foo so this is one change you would need to do in your concerns one rule that zitework follows and which is pretty useful for avoiding a lot of bugs is that there should only be one constant per file if you have and i've seen this in many projects we try to either club the constants together or um, have multiple classes so avoid this in zitework auto loading of bar in the foo doesn't work because as we know the auto loading is derived from the file name uh, as i said like the biggest usefulness over here is that constant auto loading is now thread safe so this is pretty useful uh, in applications to avoid a lot of thread safety bugs which would uh, sometimes happen in production uh, and out of the box Zitework works with bootsnap if you use bootsnap uh, which is for faster pre uh, loading of your applications a subtle change over here again is that uh, if you if you had defined this previously in your old application if you had a foo.rb file and you defined class bar in that file this would not work in like auto loading would not work in development but if you push this to production it would eager load things and it would just work so there was a mismatch in behavior between development and production so sometimes like even i had you know things work fine in test mode you push it to develop production things doesn't work like constant is not found so this now mismatch has been rectified by zitework and it will fail consistently in both environments you can start using it by setting the config autoloader via the classic or Zitework. All right, uh, next up on the newer things is this new component called as action text. Um, how many of you have heard of tricks editor? All right, some. So if you have used fields like, you know, rich text fields in your applications where you want to provide editors, uh, so tricks is one of the editors uh, again, which is being built by Basecamp. 
so it is, allows you to have rich context, uh, rich text editing, um, which now is allowed to also be done from Rails itself. So what you can do is you can start by saying Rails action text install, which will generate a migration again to store the content, or if you have some, again, if you upload some images or other files to have support of storage uh, on active storage. And basically you just have to do like these two things in your model, you will say has rich text and the name of the field you want. And then you would use rich text area and the field where you want to in get the input from uh, in your in your forms. And then you can easily display the HTML or whatever formatted content that you have with uh, just accessing that field. And you're in your controller, you would just permit that particular field. Let's take a look at how this actually looks. Um, so here, this is this is actually the tricks editor. This is how it looks. Um, if you can, if you can note, like this this functionality now is uh, is provided out of the box with Rails. So here is a form which has the. I just had to add like the field, and then tricks automatically like Rails automatically creates this uh, rich text field where you can like if you see, you know. This is this is from the Rails form automatically generated for us. A biggest thing with this is unlike other editors, if you wanted to support file uploads and other things, you had to write custom APIs where you know if you upload a file, it should go and store on your server. So this doesn't need to be done now with uh, tricks. Uh, sorry, with uh, action text, it's handled for us uh, by default. All right. Next up, uh, I'll go to some parts of applications like uh, different uh, smaller parts where other major part, uh, things have come in. So realties, uh, this is like the glute of all the different components. Uh, that's what realties does. Uh, and it is it sits on top level and combines all the other components. And so some major improvements have been done in realties wherein uh, by default now, a webpacker is the default JavaScript compiler. Uh, if you have been using, I don't know, how many of you used webpacker? Awesome. So if you have used webpacker, which was introduced like I think two, three years ago, uh, that is now the default in any new Rails application uh, instead of sprockets. Uh, a guard has been added against DNS rebinding. We'll take a look at what that basically means, uh, what, what that DNS binding attack is. Uh, and then subtle small Rails command have been added like uh, DB system change, which allows you to, if you're using a different database, like you started your application with SQLite or MySQL, you can use system change and generate a new configuration. As well as a big change has been made with regards to how you store your credentials. So how many of you have used secrets or credentials over here? Right, so secrets was added um, I think 4.2 or something. Uh, and it was pretty confusing for how secrets and encrypted secrets were being used. So it has been phased out. Uh, it's still supported, but it is deprecated. And now everything new application should use is credentials and encrypted credentials, which also support like credentials for multiple environments. Uh, here's a look at what the thing I mentioned about DNS rebinding uh, and how Rails overcomes it now. So in your application, like this is a kind of attack wherein if you have a domain name, uh, the domain could be spoofed with a different kind of IP. Like here, if you see the domain name has been assigned this 168.0.100 and then what appears to be like a local request to the application and it just gets processed. So in your, in Rails applications now by default have this middleware called host authorization. And what that allows is it will whitelist only specific host uh, which can actually process uh, the requests. So here, um, if you're on development by default, only these three uh, addresses are allowed. Uh, in production, everything is allowed, which means that config.host is empty, so everything is allowed. Uh, you can restrict what you want to support by you know specifying that, hey, all the requests should only come from product.com or whatever domain as or subdomains. Uh, Rails routes expanded mode has been added. If you have used Rails routes before, they put like a you know single line output 
which is very harder to read. So now we can you can use Rails routes expanded, uh, which gives like expanded view and easier to view. Uh, some changes in action pack. If you have used signed or you know encrypted cookies, uh, there was a kind of attack wherein a user could copy an encrypted cookie and uh, you know use it in, as a different cookie. So now in uh, by default in signed and encrypted cookies, purpose and expiry. This this metadata is now embedded so that whenever the cookie comes, it adds as an extra layer that the cookie information is always validated against what the cookie was me actually meant to be used. For example, if you have a session cookie, it will generate a session like information about, okay, this cookie is meant for session. And so it will always try to match against uh, that metadata information instead of the user doesn't know what the cookie is meant for encrypted. Like uh, it, it generates like big strings. So there's little to, little way of how that can be copied or used by someone else. Uh, if you have used integration tests, uh, you might have noticed that it allowed you to use past body in your tests. Uh, this has now been made available in your action controller tests. So in your test previously, if you, if you wanted to assert something from like, say it was returning a JSON response, what you would have to do is send a request and then do JSON dot parse, whatever the response body is. So that by default, that by now, like is now made available using response dot parsed body. So if it's a JSON response or a different kind of response, the parsed body is made available. So here you can directly compare the uh, response that is generated. Some small additions, uh, params has each value and each key being made available. Uh, I'll be now also specifying like small, small minute changes, which sound very like, you know, pretty small, but they are pretty helpful as well. So this is one of them. Like you can use each value and each key now on params. Uh, moving on to action view, uh, image alt, if you have used that has been re removed from rails because, uh, what image alt previously used to do is if you used images you're in your image tag, uh, if you sp did not specify properly the image alt, it would just pick the file name and then create like the alt tag. Uh, this is problematic because screen readers would just, you know, have some big names. Like if you're using like active storage, it will create like a big name and it was not uh, good for uh, screen readers. So by default now, uh, the users have to specify the uh, alt text instead of just auto generating it. Uh, and as as more and more packages have been introduced, uh, most of the NPM packages on the action view side have been moved under this rail scope. So if you're using, like if you're trying to upgrade, you would just have to use rails underscore, like rails slash webpack. This namespace has been introduced. Um, yeah, good, little small on action view. Uh, some changes on active storage. Uh, how many of you have already moved or are using active storage? Awesome, because everything else is mostly people like paperclip and others. They have just declared deprecated. Um, in active storage, basically when it was introduced, it used mini magic for image transformations. A major change is that that has now been changed to image processing gem. Uh, what that gem does is it is a wrapper around mini magic and uh, another gem which is called VIPS uh, libbips. Uh, which is a very faster version of image processing or transformations uh, compared to mini magic. So you can use that as well as the image processing. And because of this, there are also other formats now supported for image uh, transformation like BMP, TIFF, uh, JPEG, apart from PNG and others. Um, one another change is like that one of this, bu this bug existed wherein if you did, if you were trying to update like the attachments, like if you had many attachments over here called highlights in the user and you try to update the highlights to some different file, like a collection of files. Uh, previously, what it used to do is it used just append the files instead of actually replacing it. So this behavior was not consistent with like, say, let's say active record where you update a collection, it just replaces the collection completely. So this has been changed in the newest version to 
uh, if you do update and replace the uh, files collection it will just replace com completely or uh, instead of just attaching you can always append more files by using the attach uh, file uh, command which exists in active storage and the final newest thing which has been added oh no this is not one of the finals one of the new things which has been added to rails also is parallel testing uh, how many of you already do parallel testing uh, all right how many of you used this one parallel test gem everyone does sequential test <laughs> um so uh, rails now like out of the box supports parallel tests which many of my like colleagues are, were very excited about because as you add tests the test grows like a lot uh, like one hour or sometimes uh, so here uh, out of the box rails supports parallelization of the test using forking uh, this is similar to like the parallel gem the only parallel test gem the only difference is in parallel test you have to set the database or configure things uh, rails does this by default for us we just have to specify how much we want to parallelize uh, you can see over here you can hard code how many you want to parallelize by the number of workers or if you're on ci you can specify it like using the environment variables which is useful like if you're on circle ci or something you can specify the number of cores uh, it provides us with some hooks if it, as i mentioned like by default it will fork into multiple processes to process the tests um, and so before it processes and if you're using like a multi-tenant multi-db environment you can do some kind of cleanups or setups uh, in these like in these uh, callbacks uh, it like you can also opt in to do the other way of testing which is using threads uh, which is the default in jruby instead of forking uh, threads are used instead active job has some improvements but i will leave that out not major uh, changes in active job active support uh, lots of improvements in the unicode side of things like the unicode table was dropped uh, so rails had the uh, multi byte characters or like unicode support uh, for a while uh, but since improvements in ruby itself and this unicode table was available in ruby itself it made more sense to just like offload those things to ruby so now many of these things from multi multi byte characters and others have been uh, delegated to directly used from ruby strings uh, this improves like 1 megabyte of the unicode data is now not uh, needed to be loaded from rails it's just made available from it's directly used from ruby itself some helper methods have been added to active support like for date helpers you can do before after checks as well as parameter filter has been added to active support so if you have if you might have noticed like when a request comes in in your logs you might have seen oh this password is filtered so that was made available using parameter filters initially it was on uh, action pack and then uh, a new feature was made available in active record so it was also available on active record so it has now been extracted to active support so you can freely use it uh, in this way like if you have hash you can apply the filter on those parameters some handy methods have been introduced for enumerables and arrays uh, which if things go well you can see in ruby as well uh this method these two methods have been added called excluding and including which is useful like if you're looping over things in your views and you want to exclude some things you can specify over here like exclude and then it will remove and create a new array and then you can loop over that uh, as well as including like sometimes what you want to do is uh, for example here like post.authors including something else so you already have a set and then you want to add some different element and then loop over something like you know days of the week plus this one extra day and then loop and display those things so this is pretty useful for that and a new method has been added to to array wherein you can extract uh, the extract the numbers or like here it is a number uh, example where you can extract things or objects from the array uh, which is which is returned as well as like the original array is also changed again many more improvements in active model uh, not so major ones so i'll leave that as well 
active record uh i can create a whole big talk with what's new in active record and that can be half an hour but uh, i'm just going to stick to some major parts of active record uh basically on the uh rails tasks and then the relation and then the ddl statements so these helper uh, rake tasks have been added rails db prepare it's pretty useful like if you uh if you if if you want to like if you messed up with the migrations what you do is like you drop the database then you create and then you run the migrations instead of that now you can just rails you can do rails db prepare for example in test uh, you can do that as well as uh, we have this another method which is rails db seed replant so if you're on your development environment you're testing something with data and the database you know data is screwed up you can easily run this rails db seed replant and it will you know truncate all the information and load cd cdb again so some useful commands lots of things or improvements have been done on active record relation uh this is most of the important ones that i've put over here uh i'll just go one by one to most of them so touch all has been added uh where you can call on a collection it will touch all the objects in that collection destroy by and delete by has been added uh, as a simpler way to conditionally destroy or delete objects um reselect has been added what it basically does is unscopes the select and then selects the fields again this is useful like if you're doing scope chaining you don't know what the previous select is this is similar to like reorder you don't know what the previous reorder is sorry ordering ordering is uh you can easily use reselect so that everything before uh, is dropped and then the newer fields are only selected from your statements uh insert insert all and absort all have been added um these already existed in your fixtures so fixtures loading was done like bulk loading of objects if you wanted to do if you are running some scripts uh, that's where this that's where this is useful uh five six or seven or eight years ago uh we used to do this using you know combine sql statements and then run that on a connection instead of this now you can use these methods um where you can uh provide hashes of objects and then call insert all extract associated has been added wherein like if you have you know ha like some relationship and you want to extract all the associated objects on that uh you have to do this whole thing of preload and then collect those objects you can easily do that now using extract associated you know attributes from the collection uh after save commit has been added as a useful way of doing you know instead of running after commit hook create update and one another useful thing which is finally has been added is pick uh, so instead of doing like you know relation dot first dot pluck dot first some field uh, you can now do like whatever scope dot pick and the field name so it, it will just pull the first record and get the field on the sql side of things uh we can now do like annotate when you run the query you can call what is called as annotate and what this will do is it will uh oh this is like little harder to see but what it does is like you can say annotate and whatever the tag that you want to add uh and then this will be actually executed as a sql comment this is pretty useful because if you are running like logs and instrumentation and do want to do log analysis so you can see this in your logs and then try to find out all the queries related queries that you want to see as well as support has been added for optimizer hints uh, uh this is mostly just for mysql uh and the, what you can do is in your scope you can specify to the database what kind of you know optimizer hints you can use you can check more kind of hints on mysql but basically in this example what it is saying is that uh when you run this query the max execution time of this query is 5000 seconds sorry 50000 milliseconds all right uh active record has also gone in a lot of change with regards to multi db support uh multi db support was added in 5.2 wherein you could do uh you could use multiple databases in your rails applications like master slave or rep, uh, read write replica and so now major improvements have been added with regards to you know the commands or the functionality all around one of the useful ones over here is that the ability to switch automatically the connections so basically if 
what you would ideally want in applications is all your queries should always go to read replica instead of going to the master. And so by default, what you would say is, oh, if it's read or select, just go to read replica. But in between, if a write query comes in, it should go to the master. Uh, so this now is automatically handled by automatic switching of connections. Uh, all queries by default go to slave, sorry, read replica. And if a write query is occurred, uh, it will go to the write. It will switch the connection automatically. It will stay in that connection for an expiry period, which you can control like two seconds, stay on this you know, database, there might be more writes, and then switch back to the uh, read connection. Uh, I have been bitten by the next one a lot uh, while preventing writes. So basically, uh, the story is that if you run, if you're using Sandbox and you're connected to a, uh, to a read replica or read database, and you do a write query, your production will go down uh, because it basically will block your database if uh, your read uh, database. So basically now this you can handle on the app side wherein if you call this within a block, uh, what it will do is it will check for all write statements. And if a write statement occurs in that block, it will just raise on the application side instead of trying to connect or do anything on the, uh, on the database side. Another improvement or uh, has been added to overcome this race condition for if you've used find or create. Find or create is like, you know, find an element and then create, which is basically select or insert. The problem with that is that if there are three or four different uh, threads trying to do the same thing, it might blow up uh, that they didn't find and then it will try to create and insert and then raise an error because there are same kind of objects being inserted. So now you can instead do create or find, which is first try to create and then, you know, if it doesn't raise, then it tries to find. There are many more changes in Active Record, but uh, this is it for now. And finally, uh, the other important change is Action Cable testing. Action Cable was added a long time back. Uh, it did not have support for testing. Um, I remember giving a talk three years ago. That's when it was introduced. Uh, we now have support for testing. Uh, the two important concepts, of course, in Action Cable are the connection with which the act socket is connected, uh, like web socket is connection is created on server side. Uh, this is how it is identified. Like it will call the connect method and connect from the client side to the server side. And which now can be tested using uh, this kind of simulation wherein you can connect, you can use the connect method to simulate the connection or you can also assert whether the connection has been rejected or uh, or not. The other major concept in Action Cable is channels. And so channels are connected via subscribers on the client side. So subscribers are created, which will connect to the channels on the server side. Uh, this is an example of how the channels generally look. And so now we can test channels in a way that you can simulate subscription by saying like, oh, subscribe to a room and then you can assert whether the subscription was successfully done or not. And finally, you can also assert broadcasting. So if you have a, like a broadcasting channel broadcast to multiple people, uh, you can also do that now using, uh, you generally broadcast using broadcast to method. You can now assert that using assert broadcast to and then we are, Action Cable also has this broadcasting for to identify like the channel name. Lots of more changes, uh, but yeah, I just have like 30 seconds left now. Uh, Rail 6 RC2 is out. Uh, do give it a try. There are some bug fixes which are still being made. Uh, if uh, you still see anything, just give it a try in your applications uh, so that we can sooner, like the Rail 6 release can sooner be done. And with that, uh, I thank you again uh, for being at this talk. Thank you. Do you have any questions from the audience? Hi, thank you so much for this talk. Um, I have a quick question. So I had to do some work to migrate an app to the Rails RC Rails 6 RC1. And I was went to look at the documentation or ch change log and it didn't have much info yet. So how do you go about so when a new release comes out and there's no docs yet, how do you go about like finding what did change and how you can apply it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, 
so basically like when the release was made uh, i also help with the uh, actual update guides uh, i work on the guides uh, most of the time uh, problem is many times the guide is not like people in the rails team everyone is busy in a lot of things so uh, there is not always the features and the guides are not always in sync uh, so the easiest way to do is like use the upgrade task most of the time the upgrade task is updated uh, apart from that i generally prefer looking at change log like change log always uh, if you are upgrading any application or in fact if you are upgrading any gem always look at change log um, that's the easier way to look at things uh, but as the like the upgrade comes like the release comes by like the upgrading task is generally updated like right now it's pretty updated thank you do we have hello uh, so I have a question about the multiple databases. You mentioned that it can be used to separate read and writes. Is it uh, a flexible thing so it could be used to implement a multi-tenancy with different databases? Uh, yes. I, and I think that's Aaron. I don't know where Aaron is. I think uh, you can get more information from Aaron as well on this because GitHub uses uh, that. So yeah. Uh, with with the api that is provided it's easier to switch connections on the fly as well so it's easier to do that uh, there are already existing gems like we use octopus or makara which kind of do the same thing uh, but now out of the box rails also does the same thing like you can switch if you're doing some query and want to stick to some connection like stick to uh, the read replica or write replica you can easily do that okay great well Thank you very much for your sharing.